Now I have the pleasure of introducing our next incredible speaker. Joining us all the way from the National Epilepsy Foundation in the DC area, Dr. Brandy Fuhrman is the Vice President of Research and New Therapies. This session is entitled, From Hope to Help, Transforming Research into Therapies. I know Dr. Fuhrman has a lot of ground to cover, so let's give her a warm round of applause and get her started. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you everybody. Welcome, good morning. I um, am very intimidated to follow Joy, but I have to tell you there's a little bit of a theme. I am also a minister's daughter. <laughs> we need to talk. <laughs> so I appreciate all of your glorious insights, and um, I hope that what I share with you today will allow you to leave with a sense of profound hope for the kinds of things that are going to be possible in the very near future um, coming out of research and transitioning into therapies for epilepsies. Thank you. Okay, so I wanted to start with a, a couple pictures, and these are people who are on the research team at the Epilepsy Foundation. And I hope that you recognize one of those pictures up there. And I added Brianna, because Brianna is part of our team. She and her staff are part of our research team, and we are part of her staff. We are her remote research team, living in and working in Landover, Maryland. Um, and the thing that I want to uh, frame this presentation around is really the why. Why is it important for the Epilepsy Foundation to have a research program? The, um, the how and the what I'll also share with you, but what I want you to remember is the why. Why do we do this? Why we do this is to put into action our mission. And our mission is to create solutions to help people overcome the challenges of living with epilepsy and to accelerate therapies that stop seizures, find cures, and save lives. That's why we do this. That's our why. The how is really by investing in three priority areas in driving new innovation into the marketplace in changing outcomes for people, and in saving lives through preventing SUDEP and other causes of early death. So I'll take you through our programs that fit into those pillars. I want to start by sharing with you uh, a graphic which you might have seen in, in popular publications and um, in the news. And I'm sorry, my arrows got a little messed up in the formatting here. But this is the, pi the therapy development pipeline. Now here it refers just to drugs, but obviously we know that devices are an important part of therapy for people with epilepsy, and there's a, a device development pipeline as well. And the uh, funding that comes from taxpayer dollars to the National Institutes of Health, how many of you have heard of the National Institutes of Health? That's wonderful. This is the agency in the federal government that turns your tax taxpayer dollars into new knowledge about health, about disease, and sets the stage for other players like industry partners. We have many of them around the room today who are very important in developing new therapies for epilepsy. That basic understanding of our brain, our bodies, the connections between those things, and how they're impacted by disease really enables groups like industry partners and groups like the Epilepsy Foundation to take that knowledge and apply it apply it in ways that are important to improving people's outcome. So I encourage you to advocate for NIH funding. It means a lot to our community. And for those of you who follow uh, the news, the BRAIN initiative at the NIH has infused a lot more resources into understanding what to me is our most important organ. I'm biased, I know. But our most important organ, the brain and the nervous system. Um, so there are opportunities for the Epilepsy Foundation to build on what is happening at the NIH and in the industry space. And one of the ways that we do that is by trying to drive new ideas and new innovations into the marketplace. Two of the programs that we use to do that are called the Epilepsy Innovation Institute and the other is the Epilepsy Therapy Project. And I'll tell you a little bit more about both of those. But that's what we, we use to try to get new ideas, high risk kinds of solutions into the marketplace. We also spend time and money 
developing a better understanding of the causes of epilepsy, the consequences of epilepsy, and also biomarkers that we can use to understand who's at highest risk, whether treatments are likely to work, whether treatments are likely to pr provoke side effects, um, and who's at risk of, of the most tragic consequences, things like early death in epilepsy. So I'll tell you about our clinical programs, the Rare Epilepsy Network, the Human Epilepsy Project, and our clinical trials portal. Now, getting a new treatment uh, onto the marketplace is in, in, uh, in dependent on being able to overcome the hurdle, and it's a, it's a hurdle for a good reason, of getting FDA approval, right? In this country, the Food and Drug Administration is the agency that determines whether something can be marketed to people for treatments. So we have put in place a research roundtable in epilepsy. And this roundtable brings together regulators from the Food and Drug Administration and also from the European Medicines Agency, along with industry partners. Many of the groups here in the room are part of our research roundtable in epilepsy, together with clinical trialists and people and families. And together, this group of stakeholders um, is time up? Uh, sorry, just checking. <laughs> uh, this group of stakeholders looks at ways to overcome hurdles to approving new treatments for epilepsy. And finally, I want to tell you about a system to uh, create a new way to deliver health care and do research together in the same system to improve outcomes for people with epilepsy. So these, very broadly, are the programs that we support at the research program in the Epilepsy Foundation. And I want to share with you some of the success stories and some of the reasons for hope that are coming out of these programs. So the first I'll start with are our innovation programs. Now the Epilepsy Innovation Institute was set up to address the challenges of living with epilepsy. And when we surveyed our community, we had over a 1,000 people respond from across the country telling us about the challenges of living with epilepsy. And I see that you do this here in Michigan as well, which is awesome. One of the clear messages that we got back from that survey was that whether your seizures were happening once a year, were happening once a month, or were happening once a day, the unpredictability of living with seizures was one of the greatest challenges that affected all of the people with epilepsy who responded to our survey. And so we developed a program to try to create a seizure forecasting system, something that you could take with you on a daily basis that will tell you, what's my risk of a seizure today? And this we call the seizure gauge. So we have funded a group of uh, internationally renowned investigators, some of them at the Mayo Clinic here in the US, some of them at King's College in London, some of them in Australia. And they're working together to figure out whether factors like the patterns of seizure frequency that some people experience on a daily basis, day, night, some people experience those patterns on a, a monthly basis, certain times of the month, and some people experience those patterns on a longer time scale which is harder to recognize, but when you monitor and track seizures over time, you find that some people have these months-long patterns of seizures. We also know that there are risk factors or triggers for certain seizures in people. These can depend on your sleep quality. They can depend on alcohol use. Um, they can depend on stress, lots of other triggers. Mood and symptom, uh, Mood symptoms can change prior to having seizure activity. And there are subtle physiologic changes, so changes in your heart rate or changes in blood pressure can precede a seizure. We know all of these things happen. Can we put them together in a system that could actually measure these things ahead of a seizure and give you more of a warning, give you a forecasting system? And so this team is putting together wearable devices, things like a Fitbit, uh, an Empatica watch, um, things like a small scalp EEG that you can wear for 24 hours a day for seven days. We're putting these things together to figure out, are any of these wearables or a combination of wearables sufficient to give us a seizure forecasting system? And I'm happy to tell you this team is enrolling people, they're getting uh, wearables on people, they're, they're measuring against EEG, and they're making progress. 
The next program I want to tell you in the innovation space, so driving new ideas into the marketplace, is called our Epilepsy Therapy Project. And we do this in two different ways. One of them, probably the most fun, is called our Epilepsy Foundation Shark Tank. And this is just what you think. It is modeled on the Shark Tank show. And folks come, they submit their ideas for a new product, a new concept in epilepsy that will help improve people's experience living with epilepsy. Those ideas are reviewed and we select six fi finalists to come to the Shark Tank compet competition. We hold these competitions at our pipeline conferences, and I'll mention that a little, little later today, and they give a pitch. There's a, a row of sharks, there's an audience participation component, and through that process, we select new Shark Tank winners to help, bring, help them bring their concepts to the marketplace. We've actually had um, uh, local winners that I want to tell you about, and uh, one of those is in uh, The Sound of Seizures. This is Maisha Basha, and she's at Wayne State, and she proposed an idea to do seizure monitoring using sound. So the sounds that someone might make at the beginning of a seizure as an alerting uh, system. This is totally new in the marketplace, and we are really proud and happy to support her. Um, another Shark Tank uh, winner I want to tell you about was uh, recent was featured on CBS. This was um, a virtual reality simulation of treating pediatric patients with status epilepticus. And the goal is to give uh, medical students and fellows the experience of what it's like to try to make treatment decisions in the midst of a really stressful uh, emergency room situation. This was one of our, our winners recently. Now the uh, Epilepsy Therapy Project also awards commercialization grants. And some of the products that, we've, that I show here have been funded through those commercialization grants. Again, we have a, an application process. We have scientists review the science of that product. We also have a business advisory board review the business plan of that product. And through that process, we've developed many products that are now actually on the market and available for use in the epilepsy community. Some that you might recognize, uh, the SAMI seizure detection camera. Does anybody in the room use SAMI? This is a nocturnal uh, monitoring system for watching for seizures at night. Laser ablation therapy. Has anybody heard about laser ablation? Visualaze is one of the makers, yeah. So this is a less invasive method to do epilepsy surgery. It's an in and out procedure as opposed to an open uh, surgical procedure. The outcomes appear to be as good as traditional surgery with much less uh, invasiveness. The Empatica watch. We were one of the early supporters of the Embrace Empatica system. Um, Epidiolex, we've helped to support the clinical studies that began to get Epidiolex moving through the regulatory pathway for uh, epilepsy and others. So I just want to share with you that the, the investments that we're making into research are turning into solutions and new treatments for people in the community today in a time frame that matters. We have created a tool so that you can keep an eye on what is in the pipeline where things stand, and this is called the Epilepsy Pipeline Tracker. I put the website there at the bottom, and we'll make these slides available to everybody afterwards. But if you'd like to search for a particular type of treatment or a, a product that is at a certain place in the pipeline, you can come to the tracker and see what's going on in the epilepsy therapy development space. We've done the same for devices. So you can come to epilepsy.com backslash deviceopedia and do the same. Look for what kinds of new devices are available and coming through the pipeline. Now I've mentioned the pipeline conference and if you are interested in new therapies and epilepsy, this is a place to be. Um, the pipeline conference is a place where we bring together industry partners who wanna showcase their new products in development. And so this is held um, in March. This will be March 12th to 13th. And on the 14th, we have a community day. So the academic days are the first two. The community day is the third. And it's a showcase of everything that's happening in the marketplace. 
Um, I really encourage you, if you haven't uh, been to a pipeline conference and you have the ability to come, it's, it's a tremendous experience to be in the room with people who are thinking night and day about how to improve outcomes for people with epilepsy. Okay, so we're about halfway through, and I thought this might be a good time to give people a little bit of a brain break. So if you need a minute to kind of fidget, to move around, to stand up, change your attention, now is a good time to do it. I use joys, you can breathe in, breathe out, get yourself settled, because we're gonna talk about changing outcomes next. All right? Okay. So now we'll move to the clinical part of the pipeline. And absolutely, take your time, go, go do what you need to do and come back. Um, I mentioned that we need to do a better job of understanding causes of epilepsy, consequences of epilepsy, biomarkers that can tell us something about treatment impacts. And these are the programs that I'm gonna share with you next. But I do wanna emphasize that there is something of a paradigm shift happening in epilepsy therapy. Um, many of you are familiar with the term anti-seizure medicines, right? These are basically the current drugs that are available on the market are anti-seizure medicines. They are symptomatic treatment which means they treat the seizure, but they don't treat the underlying cause. And so you have to keep taking them in order to stop the symptom from appearing. Um, one analogy is like taking cough medicine for pneumonia, right? You can treat the cough, but you're not treating the pneumonia. As we are gaining a better understanding of the things that cause epilepsy, we can start to move from symptomatic treatments to disease-modifying treatments. And this is a big deal in our community. This means that with disease-modifying treatments, you can make a severe epilepsy less severe. You can make a, a, a seizure pattern change and hopefully get to seizure-free. And that these are treatments that may not need to be taken lifelong. These might be able to modify that disease. So this is a really exciting um, transition for our community. And if nothing else excites you about this presentation, I hope this slide excites you. And I'll tell you why. It's got a lot of words on it, right? It's really hard to read. I'm not gonna go through each one of these. But it's got a lot of words on it because these are all new medicines either recently approved or in development for epilepsy. Some of these continue to be anti-seizure medicines. Epidiolex, cannabidiol, and anti-seizure medicine. But others of them, Everolimus, Tango, some of these others are disease-modifying or could be disease-modifying medicines. And so I am incredibly excited about the future for epilepsy therapy, if nothing else, because of this slide. Now, how do we get to disease-modifying therapy? We have to understand the causes of epilepsy to get there, right? And one of the areas that has just exploded in epilepsy research over the last 10 years is our understanding of the genetic causes and contributions to epilepsy. Now, I know this looks like alphabet soup, right? All of these uh, things listed here on the slide are genes that cause or contribute to an epilepsy syndrome. And there's many others uh, that are not listed here. There's probably about 100 at this point. But the reason that these are, are so important is, number one, they are often associated with our most severe epilepsy syndromes. Early onset, uh, developmental issues, um, people not, be, not being able to reach their milestones or their full potential because of some of these rare epilepsy syndromes. But here's my hypothesis. I believe that the rare epilepsy syndromes are just the tip of the iceberg, right? I think that within a decade, we are gonna come to understand that these same genes play a role in lots of different types of epilepsy. And so the exciting part of that is if we can find therapies that address rare epilepsies and these specific genetic causes of, of epilepsy, those treatments can be useful for other, everybody with epilepsy, right? Someday, rare will not be rare. But today, we really don't understand enough about rare epilepsies 
And one of the reasons for that is because when you have few numbers of people at any one center, it's really hard to get enough of a group to study. And so we've put in place a, a group called the Rare Epilepsy Network. Now the Epilepsy Foundation hosts this group, which is about 30 different rare epilepsy organizations. And if you are a member of the rare epilepsy community, I hope you see um, one of your beloved organizations up here, the Gervais Syndrome Foundation, Lennox-Gastaut Syndrome Foundation, many others. And we've partnered together to try to um, collect information about people with rare epilepsy so that we can better understand the experience of having rare epilepsy, the consequences of these rare epilepsies, and whether there are similarities that can uh, be useful for developing new treatments. So this group came together and began a data collection. We collected data from people with rare epilepsy. In many cases, it was from their caregivers on the family history, the child's demographics, things about the caregiver, quality of life for the caregiver, which I think often gets missed. Um, but seizure characteristics, medications, development, treatments, genetic test results, EEG and MRI reports. And we've collected this information into a platform that is available, if you're interested, you can come to this website and look to see which rare epilepsies have which types of features, autism, ADHD, anxiety, um, other system involvement, gastrointestinal disorders, bone issues, and find places where rare epilepsies overlap. We also wanna, we are analyzing this data obviously, and, and one of the things that we found is that many of the rare epilepsies have five or more comorbid conditions. We're continuing to look at things like caregiver quality of life, caregiver sleep, how sleep issues affect seizures. Um, but the other piece about this platform is that we make this data available to researchers. So for those of you in the room who are, have a research bent, please come, we, we wanna share data so that we accelerate more research on these conditions. Okay, the last clinical pro program I wanna tell you about um, in this section is called the Clinical Trials Portal. Now I mentioned that FDA approval is the hurdle that new products have to get over in order to make it to the marketplace. Those products cannot get FDA approval without doing clinical trials that tell us something about the safety of the new treatment, the efficacy of the new treatment. Those are critically important pieces of data for the FDA to make a decision about. But one of the real barriers to getting new treatments to the market is getting folks to enroll in clinical studies, enroll in clinical trials. So when we did a survey and we asked respondents, would you be willing to participate in a clinical trial, 80% of the respondents said, yes, I would definitely consider being part of a clinical trial. When we asked them, how many of you actually have been part of a clinical trial, only 20% had ever participated in any sort of clinical study. And when we asked people, why haven't you participated, the number one reason was because my doctor never talked to me about it. So we have some work to do on the side with our physicians, but we also believe that bringing clinical trials to people directly might be another way to in facilitate enrollment into those studies. And so this portal is a place on epilepsy.com that you can come to search for recruiting studies. Now I know on the Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan's website, there is also a listing of clinical studies, including ones that are local to your area. It might be happening only at a single site. So I encourage you to look at either one of these or both of these to find studies that you might be able to contribute to so that your experience of epilepsy can help someone else. This is really important for us to get new medicines and new treatments onto the market. So I mentioned the FDA and the Research Roundtable, and one of the things that we do at the Research Roundtable is to try to identify issues in the regulatory approval of new treatments and therapies. I listed here the kinds of uh, topics that we explored at the most recent roundtables. Things like how do we design epilepsy trials so that we don't expose people to placebo for as long or for as many people. Um, we wanna minimize that exposure to placebo if we can. How do we think about pediatric clinical trials? You know, many of the medicines that are used in children were never formally tested in children. They're used off label. And so that creates situations where it's difficult to study 
um, medicines in children, but it's critical to study medicines in children. So how do we do a better job of making sure that pediatric uh, treatment is safe and evidence-based? Um, we've talked about, you know, we've always used the reduction of seizure frequency as the most important endpoint in clinical trials. But one of the things we hear from the community is that it's not just about seizures, right? It's about quality of life. It's about helping my depression. It's about helping my anxiety. So we've talked with the FDA and with our industry partners about are there other ways that we could measure impact of new therapies on people with epilepsy? And in this, uh, this last year, we talked about making very efficient trials in epilepsy. How can we get those answers more quickly? So the last piece I want to tell you about is called the Epilepsy Learning Healthcare System. And I love this quote from Walter Cronkite. America's healthcare system is neither healthy, caring, nor a system. Um, and I think that that's true. And many of you in the room have probably experienced um, the feeling that the health care you're getting doesn't really feel much like care. And I want to say that is not the fault of our providers. It's the fault of the system that we have allowed to, to evolve in the United States. So at the foundation, we want to try to think about doing things in a different way. What would the healthcare and research system look like if it was designed by people with epilepsy and their families, together with healthcare providers, together with community services providers, groups like the Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan who connect people to services like transportation, housing, food security. We know all of those things contribute to health, but we don't embed them in our healthcare system. And finally, what if we created a system that didn't just deliver care, but actually offered us the opportunity to learn what is best and how to get the best treatments to the people who need them at that time? What if we designed a system around those people and those priorities instead of billing, right? And so that's the idea of the epilepsy learning healthcare system. This was actually a recommendation of the Institute of Medicine way back in 2007. So it's taken us a long time, at least in epilepsy, to get to the idea that by doing healthcare differently, we can produce better outcomes for people, probably at lower cost. So a learning healthcare system is one in which patients and providers work together, they co-produce their healthcare. Um, and they choose care based on the best available evidence. And they contribute to generating that evidence. The experience of care actually teaches us something and helps us learn how to do it better the next time through. In a learning healthcare system, you are ensuring innovation, quality improvement, safety, and value. It happens in real time, and it's built on a really strong informatics infrastructure. So the system we're building in epilepsy has this as its vision, and I am so proud of this vision because it really was co-produced. The vision is for all people with epilepsy to live their highest quality of life, striving for freedom from seizures and side effects, and we won't stop until we get there. And I just want to share with you an example of co-production. When we first started thinking about how do we build a learning healthcare system, we got a lot of very smart uh, researchers, clinicians in the room, um, a couple representatives from, from uh, epilepsy groups. We put them in the room and we said, what would be the North Star for an epilepsy learning healthcare system? And everybody in the room said, oh, seizure freedom, right? We all want seizure freedom. That should be our North Star. And so we move forward with that. And a little bit later, we added more people with epilepsy and family members. And when we started bringing in those voices, this vision changed. Those family members and people with epilepsy said, if you only focus on my seizures, you have missed the boat. You have to care about my quality of life. We have to measure quality of life for this to be meaningful. And we also heard from folks who said, you know, seizure freedom is not even an option for my child right now. You can't leave me out. And so this was where the, we won't stop until we get there. We won't stop until we get there for everyone in our community. So 
The way the lear they're learning healthcare system works is that clinical teams at epilepsy centers, and there's a number of epilepsy centers participating in this network now, they collect a small amount of data from every patient that they see in the clinic. And that data is shared in a registry. It's put together with data from patients at other clinics all around the country. And we can then analyze that to see where are people doing the best? What kinds of practices are happening at this center that mean that people have better outcomes that are not happening at this center? And that we could export, right? We could share the learning that's happening in one place with the uh, implementation of that learning in another place. And in that way, we're gonna lift all boats. Uh, this system is off the ground. We have 10 epilepsy centers participating and we've embedded our community services partners like the Epilepsy Foundation Michigan into the system. We have patient and family partners at each uh, center team and we have a community engagement core to get input from people with all sorts of different epilepsy into this process. So I am really hopeful about this as the new way to deliver care and do research in epilepsy. So the final area I wanna tell you about is our Saving Lives mission. And we do this through the SUDEP Institute. The mission of the SUDEP Institute is to eradicate SUDEP and to support those people affected by it. We have a, a bereavement support specialist. If anyone has been affected by SUDEP or other kinds of early death and epilepsy and you'd like some grief support, we can, we'd be happy to offer those services. Um, the SUDEP Institute does awareness and education, but we also support research. And I'm really proud to say that Lori Isom, who's here on the bottom of the slide, um, who is at University of Michigan, is one of the co-chairs of our upcoming SUDEP Institute Research Summit. And then the last piece I wanna share with you on SUDEP is the biomarker challenge. One of the most frustrating um, and, and tragic things about SUDEP is that it strikes unexpectedly. We don't know who is at highest risk and we don't know how to prevent it. And so the biomarker challenge is a prize for a research team that can demonstrate that they've found a biomarker that is predictive for someone at highest risk of SUDEP or life-threatening seizures. So we're excited and hope that we're gonna be able to award that prize very soon. So I will let, uh, close with a reminder of our why. I've told you about a lot of programs that we do. We're working really hard to try to get new therapies into the marketplace, to identify better ways to improve people's outcomes in the healthcare system, and to prevent early death in epilepsy. And this is why. This is why we have a research program, and this is why we work so hard to make those things a reality. I would love to invite you to join this fight. Um, you can get more information on the things that are happening in the research program through our research quarterly. Uh, if you go to epilepsy.com backslash research, you'll be able to sign up for our research quarterly, or you can get it through your connection here at the Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan. Um, but we need you. We need you to help support this, to help make this, um, this fight a reality. So thank you. I just want to give you uh, oh, another formatting problem, a, a heads up that there is also, if you're interested, um, an event happening tonight called End Epilepsy Live. And you can watch this through a number of those different channels. Um, again, sharing awareness about epilepsy to a much broader public. So thank you all for your attention. I'll be here all day today and you can find me with questions. So we have a few minutes left, um, and we thought we'd use it to, uh, to offer to do Q&A. So um, we have people out there with microphones. If anyone would like to ask a question of, uh, of Brandy, now's a great time to do it. This guy went down here. Right here? Go ahead. Just coming with the oh, mic. Oh, with the mic. Okay. Can you explain to me what SUDEP is? Because I don't, I don't know what that is. SUDEP is an acronym for Sudden Unexpected Death in Epilepsy. And um, we believe it affects about one in 150,000 people um, each year. And uh, it's a, a death in someone who has epilepsy 
but for whom there is no other explainable cause of death. No injury, no accident, um, not a suicide, which we know is an early cause of death in epilepsy. So this is a, a term that is only now beginning to be more widely appreciated by medical examiners and coroners. Um, and so we're, we're not sure that the estimate that we have is actually the right estimate. It might be an underestimate of how many people we lose every year. But um, the, the issue is we don't have a way to predict who's at highest risk, and we need to find one. If I, ooh, ooh, louder. Yes. if I could just piggyback, um, we actually have a booth here today yes. from the SUDEP Institute. Um, we have a SUDEP ambassador here locally, Ian Render, and her husband, Jim. And so if you would like some time with them, they would welcome your visit to their booth as well. Yeah, and I want to acknowledge Anne has done a tremendous amount of work and, and just a fabulous job for the SUDEP Institute to share education, to share awareness. Thank you, Anne. Good Some morning, Bruce Carr. My question is, uh, given all the different kinds of changes that have happened in the United States in the past three years with the election of a new, new president, uh, how has that affected uh, the overall epilepsy programs? Uh, do you mean in terms of like funding for the National Institutes of Health and things like that? Yeah, so, so I have to say that um, the funding at the National Institutes of Health has remained healthy, which we're very pleased about. Um, and the funding for things in particular, like the Brain Initiative, has been uh, supported by Congress and by the, the White House um, through that time period. So it's, it's been a, a good time for uh, research uh, in brain health. Hi. Um, the epilepsy learning healthcare system, I find it very exciting. And Me too. So <laughs> I was, you mentioned that you were um, contracting with other organizations, and I was just wondering if those were like hospital organizations or if you do like the Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan and other statewide epilepsy foundations, or if you go into smaller organizations or even work with other chronic condition organizations to see what they do? That's a great question. So we, the, the quick answer is we want to work with anybody who wants to be part of this system. So we do have epilepsy center partners. Um, right now we have 10 of them, although none yet in Michigan, so I'm all, all ears. Um, and those academic centers are the places where the actual health care is provided and the data is collected. But we also have a community services core group, and that's where groups like the Epilepsy Foundation Michigan, um, rare epilepsy network groups like the Dravet Syndrome Foundation or the LGS, they can partner in that community services core. I think in an ideal world, we would also bring in you know, behavioral health uh, organizations and people who provide community services to wrap around what's happening in the healthcare system, to, to work together. Um, and so, yeah, the, the door is open, and I'd love to talk to anybody who's interested in, in being part of this system. The age group that um, the sudden, uh, the SUDE does, do you know the age? So SUDEP can affect anyone at any age. Um, we believe that people who have uncontrolled seizures are at higher risk than people who have controlled seizures, but I have to tell you, SUDEP has been observed in someone who has not had a seizure, um, someone with epilepsy but without having that seizure. So um, we really need to do more research into this situation so that we better understand it and can prevent it. Oh. <laughs> I was wondering if the clinical trial trials are free or do you have to see a, a certain doctor for the clinical trials? Yeah, that's a great question. So it mostly, most of the time, clinical trials are at no cost to you. Um, things that are, would happen as part of your regular health care are still covered by your insurance, you know, in the same way. But the clinical trial procedures are paid for by the study. Now, um, in some cases, there will be remuneration for travel, like if you ha have to travel to the clinical trial site. Um, but in most cases, in, in almost all cases, you don't have to pay for any of the study procedures. But that's a very important question to ask if you're considering a clinical trial. You want to make sure you understand what is it going to mean to me 
Am I gonna have to take off work? Am I gonna have to find childcare? Um, is there transportation assistance available? And that's another one of the programs I didn't actually mention, but at the national uh, office, we offer some travel assistance to, to be able to make a trip to um, a, a clinical trial site. Um, we also have some great partners who, who offer medical transportation assistance, and we can connect people to that. But that's an excellent question. Actually, a perfect setup. Thank you, Dr. Brandy, for my question. So a framing comment and then a question. Okay. I'm newly working with an organization or a team that's looking at the correlation between um, the mistrust that African-American communities have in the healthcare system because of the historical context mm -hmm. and their lack of participation in clinical trials. Um, can you speak to what you all might be doing to take a look at that or what um, you are doing? Take a look at that. Yeah, it's, it's a really important issue because I have to tell you the diversity in our clinical trial population is like almost zero. And it's an embedded historical problem for very good reasons because, you know, and I think um, any of you who know the history of research in this country knows that research has not always been ethical, it has not always been equitable. Um, and we are moving, I think, toward a much better future, but we have a long way to go. So one of the things that we really want to prioritize, like in the epilepsy learning healthcare system, is reaching out into communities that have not always participated. And I, I hope, I could be wrong, but it's a hypothesis, that by being part of the design of the system, these folks will feel more comfortable and, and know that the, pri the priorities that they bring to healthcare are being heard and are being put into practice. Um, but I appreciate the question. It's a very big problem in, in clinical trials across the board of all disease types. Yeah. For the CBD, how does that work um, for us? That's a great question. And I think, do we have folks from? Oh, okay. All right. So they're telling me there, th there's a whole talk on that coming up. And so stay tuned. <laughs> Right up here in the front. What epilepsies are considered rare? Do you have a list of the rare epilepsies? Um, yeah, I could put the slide back up of the, the groups that participate with us. Um, rare in our country is really a bureaucratic definition. It's a condition that uh, affects 200,000 or less in the US. Um, and so it's very interesting to me that as we do more and more genetic testing, um, I believe that some of our rare conditions are gonna turn out to be not rare. Um, I think one of the reasons I, I believe this is that we're starting to be able to do very sophisticated genetic analyses of, for example, um, when somebody has a, a piece of brain tissue resected, like they have a cortical dysplasia, and that is taken out for epilepsy surgery, we can analyze the genetic sequence of the cells that are in that dysplasia, which just means uh, altered you know, placement. They're in the wrong place. So when you sequence those cells, it turns out they have mutations in some of the same genes that we know affect the rare epilepsy syndromes. And so that's really one of the reasons that I think that we're going to find there's a lot more overlap than we ever appreciated before. There might be a very big range of severity, but the underlying cause in these two situations could be the same. And that's a tremendous treatment opportunity. Wrestle it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, so I've noticed that there's been a lot of research for other neurological conditions like Parkinson's or depression, and it's starting to look at different things like inflammation and gut health. And I'm wondering if any epilepsy research is looking at those connections as well. Yes, absolutely. I would say that inflammation is one of the new mechanisms that people are looking at. And uh, I can take you back to that slide where we had all of those new treatments. One of them is actually natalizumab, which came out of the multiple sclerosis world and is an anti-inflammatory treatment. But we're trying that in uh, treatment-resistant epilepsy because the idea is that the inflammation in the brain either may trigger seizures or may exacerbate seizures once they've started. Um, and so I, you're absolutely right. Inflammation is a very new emerging area for epilepsy. In the back. These are great questions.
Thank you for your talk. Um, even though there's one in 26 people I understand are gonna be diagnosed with epilepsy at some point in their lifetime, I feel like all of your great work is driven by funding and awareness. And even though I wouldn't wanna minimize the um, importance of heart disease or breast cancer or other chronic and tragic conditions, I feel like the public awareness of epilepsy is not there where it should be. Um, and do you feel like, number one, is that improving, increasing? Are there ways for us to make it more um, recognizable? And how do you feel the funding is with epilepsy? Like, is it gaining momentum? Is it, are we still struggling? Yeah, that. that's, a, that's a great question, and I couldn't agree with you more. I think public awareness of epilepsy is not where it needs to be, and so one of the reasons for a campaign like the End Epilepsy Campaign is so that our whole community has a message to organize around and to project out to the broader community. Um, it's not perfect. You know, End Epilepsy doesn't resonate with everyone, and I acknowledge that, um, but I do think that we're we're doing a better job than we have in the past of trying to include everyone in that message. You know, end epilepsy means not just ending epilepsy, the condition, but also ending the stigma around the condition, ending people's ignorance about epilepsy and what to do if someone next to them has a seizure. So all of those things are supposed to be encompassed in end epilepsy. And I think the more our whole community, our whole network can embrace that and, and project that out to the broader you know, public, um, the more our awareness is going to grow. So in terms of the funding question, it is absolutely true that epilepsy lags behind uh, conditions like Parkinson's disease, like ALS, like multiple sclerosis. And one of the main drivers for that is that in those neurologic conditions, they have dramatically larger sources of private funding. And by private funding, essentially, groups like ours, you know, uh, donors, um, partnerships with, with companies and other phil philanthropic organizations. Um, the Michael J. Fox Foundation spends, I think it's about $75 million on research alone in a year. Now, compare that to what we are able to put out there, which is probably in the order of three. <laughs> um, and I, I think we do a really great job with the, with the dollars that we spend, but Imagine what we could do if we could get our community at the, at the same level as some of these other groups. Um, I think the possibility, you know, the opportunities are absolutely there, but you're right, the funding is lagging behind. Hi, have you done research in comparison groups with people that are or have been in remission with epilepsy and seizures to those that continue to live with seizures and epilepsy? So that's a great question. We at the foundation have not, but there is a, a pretty large literature on um, outcomes of people, whether their epilepsy is in remission or not in remission. And some of that literature suggests that even if someone's epilepsy has remitted, so they're not currently having active seizures, some of their um, uh, outcomes, things like employment status, marital status, uh, SES, those kinds of things are still disproportionately lower. And I think that speaks to the idea that it's not just seizures, right? Our condition spans a, a wide range of issues. And some of those issues, even if you get the seizures under control, continue to be problems for people. So I, I appreciate the question. One more? One more? Yes. Uh, in terms of somebody whose seizures are in remission, but you know, you know precisely what can trigger them, uh, let's say lack of sleep and missing your medication, are there studies that are looking at, how can I say, dealing with that issue specifically, and that there's got to be a cause for that just beyond that one thing, I guess triggers yeah, is more so the question I'm looking at. This is a great question, and, and personally, it's one that's really important to me. Um, I actually did my PhD on a mouse model that had triggers for episodic neurologic dysfunction. It was a movement disorder, but it was still a channel disorder, which many of the epilepsies are. So um, I personally think that better understanding 
what an individual's triggers are and giving that information back to someone can be critically important to helping somebody live a better life. Um, in terms of research, I don't think we have enough research into triggers right now. But I am hopeful that things like the seizure gauge um, could help us do that on an individual level so that it could share with somebody, you know, lack of sleep absolutely is a trigger for you. Um, it, on the other hand, it could also tell people what are not triggers, right? Some of the things that we worry about and, and kind of obsess over, but it turns out they don't have a relationship to our seizures, and so we don't have to worry about those. Eating certain foods or, uh, you know, certain activities. It might free people up to do things that right now they're afraid to do because they think it's a trigger when it's actually not. So I think it's a great question. We need more research into that, into that question. Um, and I'd be happy to tell you what I found in my mouse model, <laughs> which right now is about what I could share. Thank you all very, very much. Oh, that's done. <laughs>So that was awesome. I think um, very, very inspiring, um, very hopeful. I would encourage anyone here today to go to the websites um, uh, that Dr. Furman has pointed out to, um, to get more information, to find out how you could get more involved uh, uh, and so on. Um, I think that there's so much going on today that even, even we in the foundation uh, have not been completely aware of until um, these presentations have been happening um, to bring it down to the local level. Um, and, it, and it's very encouraging uh, as far as I'm concerned. So um, I want to thank Dr. Furman for, for the presentation today, a small token of our appreciation. Thank you. I love it. Let's give another hand. Thank you.